Hi, I'm Steve Endicott, Chief Executive of the On Holiday Group. O-levels, A-levels, degree, uh, accountancy qualifications, never wanted to be an accountant, but sort of route into management. Um, I joined the industry in 1993, 25 years ago, and um, I joined International Leisure Group and I was the accountant for Hugh Morgan, another interesting character. Uh, I joined the industry because he made me laugh at the interview and there was lots of young women around with short skirts and it seemed like a great industry to me. Uh, my career history is mainly in mainstream travel. So I started at OLG, I then moved to Air Tours in 1990, uh, just after the Gulf War. And I was Air Tours while expanded in those years between 1997. And I had an unusual role that I was a commercial director, responsible for where we send the aircraft and what prices we charge. And unusually at Air Tours, when people left, you could put your hand up and say, can I do their job? So Richard Carrick left and went overseas for a while, so I took over his role. Paul Evans left, so I took over overseas contracting. Uh, I did finance. And broadly, I got an education in, in how to be an MD. But then a fatal uh, issue occurred. A guy called Peter Roffel turned up, and the fatal problem about Peter, he was young and he was good. But more importantly, he had my job. So that sort of caused a blockage, and I thought, well, where do I go if we've got a young guy there who's doing a good job? And I got seduced to go to Carson Companies, which is a very interesting move because I had my first experience of being sat in the garden. That's where a company pays you to do nothing for a year so you can't work for a competitor. If you can get a job like that, take it. Um, so I did that for a year, joined Carson. We ended up selling that very quickly to Thomas Cook. And ironically, that came together with sun, uh, Flying Colours and formed Thomas Cook Holidays. So I know a lot of people in the Thomas Cook organisation. I know a lot of people in the two organisation from my ILG days. And generally, I've been around the circuit. Um, went to the States um, in 1998 to be VP for travel uh, and spend a lot of money on the internet and developing the internet. And believe me, we wasted a lot of money. But fortunately, it wasn't my money. And in that process, I had a great education at the very beginning of the internet about how it may change the UK industry. So I came back in 1999 and did my own business, backed by the Madagatsa family, who owned Monarch Airways, and created a business called Hotties by Phone, which is a big call centre business. But I had a very unusual contract where four days a week I worked for the call centre, one day a week I could do other businesses. Madagats has had first option, but if they didn't take it, I could still do them. And at that point, we launched Holiday Taxis, we launched Rock Insurance, we launched Click with Technology, all with one desk outside my office. Uh, and they've grown into substantial businesses. Um, I did uh, Hotties by Phone until 2003, and then David Crossland, who hadn't talked, me, talked to me since I left Air Tools, came back, tapped me on the shoulder and said, um, come back, run, go in places, run Air Tools, run the internet business. And it was my dream job. Even my mum was happy that I was going back to a proper job and rather than running my own business. The only problem was, um, it took me four months to get out and sell the Hotties by Phones and Managatsas. And when I arrived, uh, we hit the uh, rail buffers very quickly and my travel went into meltdown. So instead of joining a business I intended to lead forward, I joined a business that I was desperately paddling to keep afloat. Uh, and I did that for a year and hated every moment, to be honest. Uh, a great learning experience, but not the best time of anybody's career when you're that so much of a difficulty. And on Monday afternoon, stroke evenings, uh, we used to disappear at four o'clock and play golf. And I used to play golf with the personal director, Bill Adam. And as you can imagine, he owed lots and lots of hoteliers money and he wasn't having a good time either. So we played golf, we talked about it and we said, if we weren't here, what would we do? And we came up with the concept with the On Holiday Group. And we took the brave decision to jump, uh, leave corporate life and go and set our own business up again. The On Holiday Group now carries 650,000 passengers. We turn over 125 million pound. And in essence, we are a tour operator that doesn't own an airline. It's the best way to describe it. So we break the business into four divisions. We have a B2B bed bank division that carries broadly 450,000 passengers. And we sell via the trade, be it OTAs online, be it high street agents, be it call centres. We also have a division which is B2C, where we also sell direct to customers. And one of the interesting things about the new market I think we all have to accept is a term I coined coopetition. You cooperate and compete with people at the same time. Because just as our partners have other suppliers, we have to have direct access to the consumer in case those partners don't sell us. So it's an interesting mix how the market's developing, how the internet's breaking down traditional barriers between your tour operator and your own agent to now everybody's a tour operator and everybody's supplying to everybody. So interesting concept. So B2B business, B2C business, and we also have an outsourcing division 
we called it brand borrowing. So we don't have a really strong consumer direct brand ourselves. So we look for people who do have consumer direct brands. Uh, our first example was Jet2. We created Jet2 holidays for Jet2. Uh, we got down to the last two in the bidding process for EasyJet before we got scared off by the profit guarantees. We uh, ran Audi, the supermarket chain. We ran a tour operation for Zen. We run tour operations for Port Aventura theme parks, uh, for Pierre Vacant Ski. So interestingly, we're taking the asset holders brand combining it with dynamic packaging and actually selling it for them and doing the marketing as well as the supply side. So that's outsourcing using our B2C technology and our buying power on a B2B basis. The last division, the, the fastest expanded division, is an international division where if you don't own an airline, it's a lot easier to move your model to other source markets. So we're now operating out the German market, selling Germans to Mallorca into the same hotels as the English. From Spanish, people to the Canaries and to mainland Spain and even to um, their homelands of Benidorm and Alicante. Because the English rates are quite often cheaper than the Spanish rates have available, so we can sell in those markets as well. So therefore, four divisions, in total 650,000 passengers. Annual growth is about 10 to 15%. We believe growing in line with the market because we think dynamic packages are still growing. With the international um, expansion being the big booster to our volumes is our expectation. Fundamental problem of our industry is commoditization drives margins down. As margins go down, fewer people can have jobs. As fewer people have got jobs, it's very difficult to retain the good talent within the industry. So moving forward, the industry is becoming much more technical based and much fewer people will be running the industry going forward. So the problem we've got is the big tour operators have gone from four to two. So therefore, where does the new tour operating talent come from in that arena? I'm not seeing it coming through. Internet players, the major players are tending to dominate. Yes, we're seeing new talent there, but again, quite often we see that leave because the skills they pick up selling holidays online can be translatable to so many different industries. So the biggest fear I've got is the dumbing down of the travel trade and lo loss of the lots of talent and the characters that we've historically had in the industry. Secondly, because there's fewer and fewer reps, one of the structures our industry used to have is people went overseas, trained, and became area managers. Now that is an invaluable experience in how to run a business that you really wouldn't get in the UK. And then they came back into the UK in middle management roles and developed through. Now we've got fewer and fewer reps, where's the starting point for that career progression for people to come through our sector? So again, it's very difficult to see in the future where we're going to get the talent, where we train the talent, and how we afford to train the talent with so low margins. Uh, one of the things I'm proud of is one of the things that nearly ended my career at a young age, funny enough. Um, it's a long story, but I'll give you the short version. Um, I was in charge of the overseas operations of air tours, and I used to fly to um, Orlando a lot because I was doing the contracting out there. And Orlando International is owned by the Shetland Airlines and treated charter customers like scum and really gave them a massively bad experience. For example, you'd land, you will collect your luggage, and then you have to get a um, car over to the other terminal, so you have to give your luggage back. So you've just got it once, and then you've got to give it back and go and collect it again. And then you have to get a bus from the airport to the car hire place to get your car, and then there's a big queue. And it was literally taken, we researched, it's taken our average customer three hours from arrival, getting through customers, getting your bag, getting the car in Orlando. Well, that is not the way you want a customer to start their holiday. But because the air airport was owned by the big scheduled airlines, part of that was quite deliberate. So I was very frustrated, and I had a very lucky or unlucky experience to meet a gentleman called Tim. And we went for breakfast, and he said, I've got this airport called Sanford. You've got to come and see it. So we drove along these roads, and they got smaller and smaller roads and more and more houses, and we pulled up outside this wooden shack. And he said, this is the terminal. And I went, You've got to be joking. This is the terminal for an airport. And he goes, no, 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 you're dismissing the point. And the point he made is he made me walk the entire length of the runway. I think it was a mile and a half or something like that. And he said, this is 90% the cost of an airport. Forget the rest. I can build that for you. What do you want? And we went back and we had lunch. And I've still got the drawings where we drew a rival area with a massive number of uh, customs, with lots of baggage, and the car hire on site right outside of the terminal. And a year later, we built it. And it's fascinating to go through that whole creation of a new airport. It saved air tours an awful lot of money. I think it was about 20 million over the five years. But here's the bad side. Unfortunately, Tim died three weeks before it was meant to be opened. And as you can imagine, that left a void of management 
and then I had to go over there and the airport wasn't finished and I had three weeks of sheer hell thinking the first plane is going to arrive here and it's going to be absolute chaos. So that's the lesson you learn in life. You can be a hero or you can be zero very, very quickly. And the difference between the two is just a flip of the coin. And you have to get lucky and you have to make the right decisions in times. But even when you do, don't think that's always going to make you the right person and you won't always be a hero. You can just be a failure just as quickly. The interference of Eurocrats is going to be a major disaster in our industry unless we deal with it. Um, I'm on the ABTA committee, committee um, looking at the package travel regulations that the European um, government are looking to revise at the moment. And quite frankly, so many people are unaware of this and it's a massive impact it's going to have because the Eurocrats really have no idea about the modern world. They want everybody to go back to the old-fashioned traditional tour operating. So I'll give you a few examples of things that they're proposing. They want to make agents liable for health and safety. Well, how does that make any sense? First of all, we've taken financial liability for the failure of an airline. That doesn't make sense. It really should be a one pound charge for every airline so that basically whether you get on the airplane and you've bought accommodation or you just get on the airplane or you've made your own arrangements, it, you should be treated the same. Saying that an agent should be treated differently because of self-flight is ridiculous. Saying a hotelier should not be liable for health and safety, but an agent should be liable in their place is ridiculous. So there's two fundamental flaws. But also they're talking about things like introducing a 14 day cooling off period. Now that's perfectly logical and it has been introduced in many other sectors, but they're not going to apply it to airlines. So an agent packages a holiday with a low cost uh, carrier, pays for the flight. The customer within 14 days says, I want to cancel and the agent stuck with the flight. That's just completely unjoined up thinking. It's a nonsense. But as we've said in the past, if you don't actually get on board and deal with the Eurocrats very quickly, you can end up with regulations that are meaningless and very, very damaging to our sector. And at the moment, I think there's a massive lack of awareness of that as a topic. The first paper comes out in March, and we need to mobilise the agency community to say, this is not acceptable. Yeah, this doesn't make sense. We're no longer going to be the patsies for government and you've got to impose these regulations on the hotels and the airlines and not just on agents because we're weak. In the old days, like me, you probably had to do accountancy qualifications if you really wanted to make it to the top of management. These days, I think that's changed. Now, I think you need to be a technologist. You have to understand how technology works. You have to understand how to analyse data and you have to understand how to market and spot trends. But even in the marketing side, most of it's analytics. So I'd say get onto a technology course, maybe still go for the finance route, but understand it's a commercial role in travel because the days of being a rep or the days of being an air manager and going through that route are probably gone. The days of just being an accountant and getting promoted through are probably gone. So you need a broader skill set, very much internet savvy in the, in the current travel and going forward. What I've done on the holidays evolved with children. Um, before I had children, we went on long haul holidays to the Caribbean, to Cuba, to South America. We went around the world. We had children that all stopped dead. So for the last um, 15 years, our holidays have been based around short haul duration, uh, destinations such as Mallorca or the Algarve or Menorca or Ibiza. And basically what we've always looked for is space. So we tend to go for villas or private accommodation rather than the hotel rooms. Shouldn't say that really, should I? Since it's what I say, but that's the truth. And uh, we tend to hire a car and go and look around the destination. So quite relaxed back. Now the children are older, it's much more orientated around, I want to play golf, or I always wanted to play golf, but now they want to play golf, and doing more activity side. So we're big into skiing, we're big into golf, uh, and my wife's big into laying on the sun lounger and ignoring us all. I have three boys, by the way.